forensic team does think that there is a disability and they move for an evaluation. The evaluation should be comprehensive. So um, sometimes students might be referred because you think they might have just a speech and language issue. Um, so we would never go into an eval and just look at it by itself and only say that it's a speech and language issue. We want to make sure that it's broad enough that we find out everything that that child may need help with. And we could be assuming that it's a speech language issue, but there might be other pieces of it that are really impacting. So, if you, you know, when you go to the doctor and um, you, your child has an ear infection, you, when you walk in the door, they don't just look at your ear. They do lots of other things because there might be other issues that are going on. So, I mean, anywhere you go, they're not, like, if you, how many, y'all have, like, when, you know, you walk in, they put you on the scale, they weigh your height, they take blood pressure, just to make sure that they've ruled out that there's not some other things going on. So we do the same thing through a comprehensive eval to make sure we've covered all the bases, that we get every kid what they need comprehensively. through some kind of evaluation procedure and they have to have a disability that is meets the, um, the criteria to have a disability in a school setting. So there are some words that we have like in one half there's a list of the different um, disabilities we have. And then in the medical world they have their disabilities and they call them what they're going to call in the medical world. Sometimes they transfer over nicely to the education and sometimes they don't. So we'll have to look and you know, figure out what fits where. So, but you first have to meet some kind of that criteria that the schools have set. And then the other part of it is that you have to, they require specially designed instruction. So that's the piece that makes an IEP different from a 504 plan. 504 is about access, but they don't need instruction. An IEP gives them access and instruction. So those are the two things. So they don't need to be taught any new skills. They just need like extra time or to sit in a, you know, a certain area in the classroom. That's a 504. If they need instruction to learn a skill, that's an IEP. Okay. Um, so to be eligible for special ed, they have to, both of those, they have to have a disability and they require specialized instruction. This is a list of categories. Um, DD is going to be the little kid, so you won't come across those if you're in the secondary school. Um, speech language, um, specific learning disability, that's our largest population in our district. Larger percentage of kids in special ed have a learning disability. Intellectual disability, um, so there's three ranges for that. You can have mild um, intellectual disability, moderate, and severe and profound. Those, um, the moderate, severe, and profound are most likely going to be like in a self-contained program. You may have students in the gen ed setting that have a mild intellectual disability. So that would be impairments in cognitive functioning, um, academic functioning, and their ability to carry out daily life skills, um, like taking care of themselves, eating, dressing, um, accessing public community services. Um, hearing impaired, visually impaired, emotional disability, um, autism, other health impaired is that, um, that broad category, so lots of the medical conditions that we're going to get from doctors will fall under that, so ADHD, epilepsy, um, diabetes, any kind of medical condition um, that also requires, that has impacted something educationally that they need that um, instructional support. Um, orthopedic impaired, traumatic brain injury, multiple disabilities could be a combination of any of these and then deaf blindness. And I don't think there's anybody in our district that has that, that last category. But we have somebody in every of these other categories. All right. So, IEP meeting. So that you would likely at some point in time be invited to an IEP meeting. So parents can be invited, any student that's 13 and older. So if you teach students that have IEPs, they should be invited to their IEP meeting. 
Um, the gen ed teacher, so if the special ed teacher, definitely, I think, I think who, is there just two special ed teachers in here? Two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Um, then the LEA, so that's going to be an administrator. So that's somebody who is able to allocate funds. So if somebody needs um, a, a device or some kind of instruction or something um, that's going to cost money, that that person would be able to allocate those funds for the district and is able to oversee the implementation of the IEP. So that's the person that's going to hold the people accountable for what is written in the IEP. Um, so it really should not be a guidance counselor because they don't supervise and they're not able to allocate funds. Sometimes they do in a rare circumstance if an administrator is out of the building. But um, it should not be. It should be an administrator. Um, then any related service providers such as um, OT is occupational therapy, PT is be physical therapy. Sometimes speech is a related service. Um, could be um, a vision teacher. Could be an orientation and mobility specialist. So anybody who provides a related service would be there. And then some, at times, if they're going to be going over any kind of evaluation stuff, somebody who can interpret that data. But, so your, most of y'all's roles are going to be that um, gen ed teacher. So it's a team. So if you've ever sat in one and one person's doing all the talking, it was not done the right way. Everybody's an equal member. The IEP is developed by the team. Um, the special ed teacher will come in and have the draft written just so that everybody's not sitting there for hours on end developing an IEP. But gen ed teachers' input should be used in developing that IEP. So speak up. Um, we have also given um, advice to teachers, special ed teachers, in writing the IEP to share the IEP before the meeting with people on the team so they can review the document so they know what's in it, so that they can participate as an equal member in the development. So think about when you took college classes, if you didn't read the chapter before you walked in, you were at a loss in those classes. So to prepare for meetings, um, if you could get, you know, have access to that document ahead of time so that you could have some input in, and also be able to participate intelligently in the meeting and know what's going on. Um, and so valid um, multiple measures, so it's just not the data that the special ed teacher collected. It's going to be also information that you as a gen ed teacher bring to that table. Um, the whole purpose of special ed is to um, provide supports to students so they can make progress in the gen ed setting. So you're going to have the most valuable information of what they need so that they can make it in general ed. So don't be shy to give that information in a meeting. Um, so what should you bring to that meeting? So grades, um, anything about behavior and attendance, anything that's affecting what's going on in that classroom. Um, progress reports that you have, um, work samples, any of that is going to be valuable to that team in developing that IEP. When they get to you to um, provide input, so my advice to you is start with something positive. That parent already knows that their child has a disability. They, um, that's already something that's like emotionally taxing on them. So if you can start with something positive and then talk about their needs and try not to be overly negative. Lots of times uh, uh, these students are going to have some behavior problems and you're going to want to take that opportunity to make it become a parent conference of like the issues you have in the classroom. So be careful that you talk about what's needed to develop the IEP and what belongs in a parent conference so that you kind of separate those two. But the biggest piece of advice is to say something positive. Um, that parent's going to hear lots of things as that meeting goes on about what their kid is not able to do. So they need to hear what the child's able to do. Okay? All right, so special ed teachers, Y'all know what you have to do with that. Um, so I'm just going to skip over that. Unless y'all want me. So they're going to bring in their data related to special ed. And they hopefully will have a draft IEP written so that you're not having to write the IEP in the meeting. And so that team is going to decide what the goals are going to be. What accommodations? Um, so accommodations are things that are put in place in the gen ed setting, so not in special ed setting. 
So in special ed, they're going to be providing instruction on what they need, and they're already going to be um, teaching to the level that they're at. So with, when they're in gen ed, they're expected to do um, work on the, the grade level work. So they're going to need accommodations. So if I took my glasses off, I wouldn't be able to see. I need these to be able to access and know what's going on. So there, that's a discussion of what do they need in place so they can access what's going on in that classroom. Not necessarily what do they want so they get an advantage because they have a disability. So it's not for them to necessarily make an A. It's so that they are able to access what's going on in that classroom. So if they can read and access the text, they would not need oral administration. Um, so if, now it could be if you read it, they might perform better, but do they need it to be able to access what's going on in the classroom? So just um, be careful of accommodations that there are things that are reasonable that you can implement in your classroom, and it's actually what the student needs, and not something that's going to give them an advantage over a gen ed student. Okay, that this special is not about, does that make sense? Like you don't want them to get an unfair advantage in that situation. But um, that's where your input is needed of what that child needs in your classroom to be able to do what you need them to do. Um, modifications are changes and what's expected. So that would be gaining an advantage, making a task easier. So if you, um, if this is, I don't think they'll do this anymore, but if you were to give a spelling test and you only give them half of the words to learn, so you just made that e test easier because everybody else had to learn 20 words and they only have to learn 10, so that would be a modification of what they're expected to learn. So if you cut the material in half, um, so if you only have them do, so if you have a math assignment, everybody's got to do 30 problems and they only have to do 15 of them, it would be a modification if you only did half of them, if the 15 you gave them are the easy problems and they never get to the hard problems. So a way to get around that is maybe they do the even or the odd, because usually the harder problems are at the bottom of the page. So if they do the first 15 and they never have to do the last 15, they never got to the hard problems. So just be, um, if you reduce the work, just make sure that you didn't take away the hard problems that they're still doing the level of work there. Um, and then the team can decide how much time do they need to be in special ed. So if they can participate in gen ed or anything, that's where they need to be. Um, I just got out of a meeting and we were talking about recess and the kids in special ed go to the little playground instead of the big playground. Why? Why what is it about them that they're not able to go to the big playground? Um, and so it's, it's actually caused an issue, and we could have never even had the discussion if there wasn't two separate playgrounds for children with disabilities and children without. Same thing like in the cafeteria. If you, why are they sitting at a separate table? And so why is there a special ed table, and why are there gen ed tables? I mean, what about their disability makes it that they can't sit with everybody else? So just be mindful of what part of gen ed they're able to participate in, and they can participate in it, that's where they need to be. So what about their disability? makes it that they cannot participate. If you can't answer the question, then they need to be in the gen ed setting for that. Yes, and that's about inclusion. You know, when they go to McDonald's, they don't have a separate table. When they go to Swan Lake, there's not a separate playground for them. There might be um, some of the playground equipment might be something they can't get on, and maybe we need, you know, there needs to be like an adaptive swing on the same swing set so they can get on it. But when they leave school, they are right in with everybody else. So in school, we need to be putting them in settings with their um, hygiene and peers as much as possible so they can function in the real world. All right, so LRE, so these are the, so once you have gained access to special ed and you have an IEP, then there's a continuum of levels of support. So itinerant are going to be students that might go once or twice a week to get support from a special ed teacher. Resource or supplemental, this will be every day for a short period of time. Core support is that they're getting some of their core instructions like ELA, math, science, or social studies from a special ed teacher. Self-contained is they are all day in a special ed classroom. Um, so they everything, even like homeroom and lunch. 
um, home-based, students that are served at home, um, that's likely going to be for discipline reasons, mm -hmm. and home-bound is at home for medical reasons. Those would be the two differences there. And then it can actually go beyond that, that we could have res residential placements as well, but I don't think we have anybody in our district that we have in a residential placement. All right, so after the meeting, the parent's going to get a prior written notice that's going to list exactly as a result of the meeting today, this is what we're going to be doing moving forward for this student. So um, you could also read over that to know what you know is in place as a result of that meeting. And if we're going to, um, for an initial placement, the parent has to give consent. So along those same lines, if a parent can give consent, a parent can also do what? What's the opposite of that? not give consent or revoke consent. So that actually happens a lot more frequently in middle and high school than it does in elementary. So you may have students that are like getting services and the parent comes in and revokes consent and then they become a general education student. So the parents have that right. Um, that's the, everything else is special as a team decision, but that decision to provide services or to not provide services is the parents that they're the only one that has that, that's their right. Um, and that's not, we're not allowed to do any kind of due process or fight that decision to either provide services or not provide services. Now, the IEP is a legal document, so when we talk about those accommodations, and so you're a member of that team, um, that's why I said make sure it's something that is appropriate that can actually be done in the classroom, because if it ends up being written in that IEP, then you are obligated and required by law to do that. So if there is something in there that says they get oral administration for all um, tests and assignments, then that has to be done. And if you don't provide that accommodation, then you are in violation of that law. Same thing with 504. Um, so there's been times when if you don't listen to me or if you don't do this, I'm not going to read that test to you because you weren't listening when I taught it anyway. Can't do that. Somebody's determined that's a, an accommodation they need to be able to access that test, so you have to provide it. So you can't withhold um, accommodations, even though you think that the kid doesn't deserve it. It's not about deserving it. It's what somebody determined needed to happen. So if there's anything in there that you think that you're not, it's kind of unreasonable, I don't even know how to do it, that's where you need to speak up so that when they're developing it, something doesn't end up in that IEP that is just off the wall that nobody could implement. Okay? Um, if I were you, I would document that you have provided that accommodation so that if somebody comes back and questions you, you have the documentation that was actually provided. All right? So it's not a choice to provide an accommodation. 504 um, is actually more serious if you don't provide a 504 accommodation than if you um, don't provide a special ed accommodation. Um, OCR um, regulates 504 and they can come in and provide you know, their sanctions and lots of stuff and you could actually end up in court a lot quicker for a 504 violation instead of an IDA violation. IDA is going to go to your special ed and they're going to tell you to fix it. OCR is going to come in and there's that, there could be sanctions for it. So find out who your kids are that have 504s and IEPs. You should have gotten some kind of document that says what the accommodations are that you're going to be providing in that clinic setting. And you should assign that you got it. So double check on that. These are all things that could happen once a kid has access to special ed. So if they transfer from district to district, it follows them. School to school, it follows them. Every year, they're going to have an annual review to develop a new IEP. Every three years, a team's going to meet to determine if they're still eligible for special ed. And you would be involved in all these meetings as gen ed teachers. Um, manifestations, so if they're, if they're ever um, recommended a change of placement because of a discipline issue, they're going to have a manifestation to determine if the disability caused the behavior. And if that happens, if the disability is what caused the behavior, then it's not treated as discipline. Um, it's dealt with through the IEP and what changes do we need to make to the IEP, what services, do we, do we need additional services. So those students might actually stay in the school setting um, where they could have done the same thing that a gen ed student did, but their disability was the cause of the behavior 
and they're going to stay because we need to deal with it through education um, instead of discipline. So it wouldn't be a discipline issue. Okay. Um, a FIBA, a functional behavior assessment, and a BIP, a behavior intervention plan, the students would get, so if there's any kind of behaviors interfering, those would be developed. Um, dismissal, so they would either graduate with a diploma or they're no longer eligible for special ed or the parent revoked consent. Um, so either one of those last ones, dismissal or aging out. And 21, once they turn 21, that at the end of that school year, they would no longer be eligible for special ed services. Tamara's name. T-M-R-A. Alright, that's all. That's it. Alright, thank you very much. Uh, hello everybody, I'm Vivian McGaney and, and I manage the curriculum and instructional piece for special services. And um, I, I don't know how many, I, I saw some of our special ed teachers in here. But I think most of you are general ed teachers, and I just wanted to piggyback on some of the things that Laura was saying about accommodations and LRE. You may be aware that our superintendent is really, she has a vision of, of becoming more inclusive with our students, which will really lessen the time that our students are in, but pulled out, so they will be with you more. And um, I'm going to ask Angie to put something on each table. And I'm going to, y'all are secondary, so I'm going to ask, oh, good. And so while she's doing that, I'm going to sign in, I'm going to pull up something. I just want to leave you all with a strategy that you can employ with the students that you have. And this will be a way of accommodating. Um, when Ms. Booza invited us, she said that she wanted us to talk about accommodations. Now, Laura um, talked about accommodations from a compliance standpoint. Um, but when it comes to instruction, instruction is where the rubber meets the road. And most of our litigations uh, are because our students are not performing at the level parents want them to perform. So in order for them to perform at an acceptable level, it takes a lot of instructing and planning and things like that. So I'm going to pull up something, then I'm going to ask you all a question. Just give me a second. You can take a stand up stretch if you want. Yeah. <laughs> sure, okay, so at the end of the class, essential please, I'm going to appreciate you can come here and sign your. Attendance, please. You got two documents. One is for international teachers, and the other one is for your teachers in the um, school district. Um, basically, um, this information is for international teachers. Uh, we put out a document here that says special education workshop that is being given by these um, professionals, and then we're going to go over this document coming session. It's about the child's rights, the important terms to know. Basically, when we came to the United States as international teachers, we don't know a lot of information about the inclusive education that we have here. Why? Because in our schools, in our systems, in our countries, it, it, we got certain schools for a specific student. A specific student. What I like about the United States is that we inclusive education. So every kid can go to the class and they can just socialize and interact with everybody. In our schools, in our countries, we got special, special schools for those special students. But here is a wonderful, wonderful moment that we're experiencing now with inclusive. And now we got Dr. Penelope Knox, who is really in charge, and she is really giving the strong, the strong, the solid fundamentation and foundation of inclusive. So that is really important that we know as international teachers that here in San Francisco School District, we got inclusive. Um, educational environments. So for that reason, I want you to just take a look over this document before we got the new session and come in about two weeks, I think, and we're going to discuss about this. There are a lot of terms, terminology that we don't know about FERPA, about IDEA, about LRE, least restrictive environment, accommodation, what is accommodation, what is modification, and we got a lot of words here that are really new for us, okay? 
So IEP, Individualized Educational Program, what that is, so um, idea, and well, and we're going to discuss a little more terminology or terms um, regarding to this important topic for us. Right? So. Oh, that's right. You got it now. That's good. All right. Um, I have a standard, and it's an eighth grade standard, and it's a mathematics standard. Um, standard. How many of you are math teachers? Okay. And it's a long standard, and really needed to be reconstructed. You see how it looks? It's still incorporated. All right. Um, the gist of it, I can't quite recall the, the um, exact wording, but what the student is to do is to find the surface area of, a, of different three-dimensional three figures. But for this one, the constructing it is ought to be down to um, a cylinder. So my question, why is it that I gave you a can of Pringles? If we are... Okay. want to have it. You want to? Of course, I don't want you to have it. Um, thinking, about, thinking about the standard, why would I, and thinking about struggling learners, why would I want to use a can of, of Pringles? Okay, a visual, and what was something else? They can understand what surface area is. They can understand what surface area is. Okay, go They can relate to... Yeah. The Pringles, every time they hear about Celia, they'll remember the Pringles and the It has to learn. All that we, um, um, special, or well, children who struggle, and they're not all your kids with IEPs either, you will find that you will have to be very creative with ways to teach struggling learners. And this is one way, make it authentic, give them something authentic. The can of Pringles is something authentic. And you could even display a building that has different figures on it. You know, like those church buildings that have the big temple, and you can see the different solid figures within the structure. And sometimes you have that big round thing. You ask them what shape is it? And they, they'll be able to tell you once you, you know, get down to the, the nuts and bolts of what these solid figures are. So, um, a little quick activity that I want you to do, and I, I won't require you to take it apart. When, when we're done, you can, you can take the Pringles and eat them. But if you, look at that, if you look at that can of Pringles, and you're talking about surface area, trying to find the surface area, how could you tell a child to use that can to break it apart to help them find the surface area of a cylinder? They could literally open it. Yes. I'm not going to open it, but maybe it's... You can, you can open it. Okay. <laughs> Will you hold that up, please? Oh, that lid that you have. Let's take, take, a, take, take the lid off. Take it completely off. Take it, okay, hold the lid off. Completely off. Okay, and so what is that? Set, like, okay, so you're breaking it apart. So if you're trying to find the surface area of that cylinder, one of the first things you're going to teach them is what? That area of a circle. All right, you mathematicians. What is the formula for area of a circle? Area equals pi times radius squared. All right, and so this, the, the bits and pieces that you do, you have to have them to measure it. Is that right? And to see what maybe the diameter is first. And then figure out half of the diameter to get what? The and see all those are things that you're teaching them. But how what about okay, so that's just one part of it. That's the first step. This part of it. Usually I use a piece of paper instead of yes. glue it together so I can cut it open and yes. see shape. Exactly. So that's so what you would do. You would just learn about the circle with a rectangle. So you all get the gist of it. Kids that, that struggle need those type of tactile, they, they, they need to be able to use all of their modalities when it comes to learning. You have the visual there, you've got your tactile, 
and, and you're teaching them, you're, you're using explicit instruction. And that's what our, our kids, especially ed kids, require. And you will see within their IEPs that they, um, their accommodations might require the use of manipulatives. That's it. It, it doesn't always have to be um, units and rods and plants. It can be anything uh, that physical that you can use, like a concrete. Because what you're doing is you're trying to get them to, to on the conceptual level, to use concrete items and, and advance the pictorial and then to abstract. So that's, and that's what our struggling learners need. And, um, and so, the child who is struggling will easily be able to see that the top of it is a circle and the same is for the bottom. So to find the surface area of this Pringles can, this cylinder, you would have two circles, pi times the area square, times the radius square, I'm sorry, and then one, if you open up this part of it, it's a, a rectangle, left has the width, and then they do their addition, and they cut it, and it's easier for them, and they'll be happy. They have opportunities to, to succeed. Okay, that's just an example. So, so have fun. Y'all can take the titles. <laughs> but um, please give, a, you know, um, when, you, when the general ed teachers, I mean, when the special ed teachers share with you all um, the accommodations, think about the explicit teaching using something concrete, manipulatives and things like that to help them to learn the concept. And you'll find some happy learners. Thank you again. Right, thank you very much. This is great. All right, so we conclude the session today. Uh, thank you very much for coming, everybody. Do not forget to sign the bit here. Have a great, great afternoon. See you soon. <laughs>